Boom, 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 literature gets a look. Let's talk about books. Hello and welcome back to Legs Talk About Books, the monthly literature podcast where, guess what, we talk about books. I'm your host, Hard Leg Joe. Joining me today, special guest, Bard Breaker. Good morning, everybody. It is pleasure to be here. You're using a funny accent for your introduction so they don't know who you are. I must disguise myself. Oh, okay, so they don't find your... Bard Breaker has a YouTube channel if you're if you like his voice... And you like Pokemon if, challenges. If you like that voice, don't come to the channel because it's never <laughs> used on there at all. <laughs> Listen, joining him today, we have a not-so-special guest without a YouTube channel. He's just some dude, but you may know him as CB Radio. I will inform you that my teachers did say I was very special. For other reasons. You just get, you're bringing out those jokes right at the beginning? Yeah. I don't, I don't think those are in good taste, my bud, my dude. In your taste my buds? Friend? No. No, just, okay. Anyway. <laughs> we're talking about a book. Welcome, yeah, welcome to the show. We're play, we're doing literature, which is means this is a fancy show, which means we're not making a bunch of puns. Although we are, we are reading <laughs> satire today. We have read We'll Save the Galaxy for Food by Yahtzee Croshaw, who you may know is, is Yahtzee on YouTube. He's been like a video game reviewer since... I think for like more than 10 years now, he's been around for a while. Oh god, to date the internet is so very, very strange. But yeah, he's been doing it for a, a minute at least. Yeah, we probably should have looked this up beforehand so we could say stuff about him. But Does he ever actually play Yahtzee on his channel? I don't think he has yet, but I don't know. I, I where don't does the know. nickname come from? He's Bingo. Been, he's been doing a lot of stuff. I know he, he's made like a couple games. No, Bingo is a different <laughs> game. But yeah, so once again, we're reading a famous YouTuber's book as we have done before. And if you're unfamiliar with the show, if you're joining for the first time, what we usually do is we give our review first, kind of like spoiler-free thoughts for those of you who haven't read the book, who might be interested in reading it. And then after at some point, we're going to just go in and talk about the book as assuming you've read it. So to begin with, um, I guess you're the special guest, Bard Breaker. How, how would you rate this book? What did you think of it? Um, I don't know. I thought it was okay. Like, I, I don't hate it. I don't like love it. I'll probably give him more money and read his next book though. Yeah. You said you were interested in reading the second one. I'm I am not sure interested. if I'm going to, but that's only because I've got other books and stuff to read for the show. And I'm not, like, super sold on this one. But before I go into mine, I'll do mine last. Uh, Brandon, what did you think of this? I thought this was a lot more enjoyable than I anticipated it being. Because I haven't YouTuber actually... books have a reputation. They do. And I didn't. I hadn't actually uh, read any YouTuber books. This was my first foray. Into yeah, this. me and, me and Bard Breaker are actually, like... We, this is kind of a thing we've done at this point. It's a couple times now, but... um. Yeah, this is definitely the best of the ones we've read. You just have it in for the Ables. Like, I, I did not like that book. I loved that book. So we were like polar opposites, like Statler and Waldorf on the front of the boat but there. Did, did you like this one better than the Ables? Still? No, I liked the Ables better. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, but yeah, sorry, go ahead. But to finish it out, though, um, yeah, I, it had. Uh, I would actually 100% recommend listening to the audiobook version of it because Yahtzee's voice, and obviously is the one reading it, uh, paces it really well. Yeah, I've heard that from the... We had a couple people actually read along with us on the Discord for the first time. And we actually had someone on uh, Twitter who asked if uh, what we would think of the audiobook if we listened to it. And the general consensus seemed to be the audiobook is much better than reading it. In, in my opinion, the first, like, fourth of this book really kind of dragged. It, it took me a while to get into it. But then once it kind of got into itself... It was much easier to finish it up. You're nodding along. I guess you'd agree yeah, with I'm, that. I'm, I'm just like picturing where things like... You're talking about where it, it turns into the part where the things do the thing with the, the people when, when and the thing. When they get on the other planet, let's right, say. Yeah. That's without mm -hmm. spoilers. Yeah. That, then it really kind of picks up, in my opinion. And but then everything before that was kind of like, eh, this just kind of feels weird. Mm, yeah. I, I, can, I can agree with that. Yeah. It, it's weird for me because normally when I rate a book, I don't have like a set scale. Uh, I, I've been oh, you this... wanted me to put it on a scale, but Mister doesn't hold himself to his own standards. I, I do have a I do have a rating system. I just don't put it on a number scale. Normally, I have like four things that a book can accomplish, and I'm like, which one does it accomplish the most? If it succeeds in any of these four things, then I consider it a good book in some way. And then, like a great book will do two or three of them really well. 
But this one does like everything like mediocrely. It's <laughs> it's like a it, it, it it's like Waffle House. I, it, yeah, it's the Waffle House of books of science fiction satire books. What can I say? It's it's a solid six out of ten because it just does everything slightly better than average. <laughs> it's like even if I, if like if I had to rate the start of this book, it would be like a four out of ten, and if I had to rate the end, it would be a seven out of ten. So together, it just makes like a six. Mm-hmm. It's just it's just slightly better. So th- there's nothing like super special. It's that don't do the math in your head. I know what I said. Just trust me. It's a six out of ten. It's 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 decent. It's better than decent, but it's not amazing. It doesn't do anything that I'm gonna write home about. <laughs> might, might I say that I really like Waffle House? So, <laughs> yeah. so it actually. I thought you're gonna pipe up at the math numbers, and you're just like uh, circling back to Waffle House. You know the grits and the it's, mashed you potatoes. Know, we could discuss this book, but would you rather discuss Waffle House for a moment? Well, I thought the back side of the menu was really derivative of the Denny's <laughs> books that came before it. I'm gonna just say that you can get pecans in your waffles, and that's just that's in. Finish for me. I, I just like plain waffles, so you know it, it doesn't do a whole lot. Their waffles actually aren't as good as their hash browns, in my opinion. I'm surprised you even eat hash browns, but I can understand why you don't like pe- uh, pecans because that's almost like a vegetable. And, yeah, but you know potatoes are a vegetable, and but, you eat but those. potatoes I eat like French fries. Mm-hmm. So the hash browns are kind of like French fries, especially when you get them like well done, and because they actually have a cook making them, they'll actually like make it really good for you if you request it and tip well. You mean? Slightly above average. Yeah. Remember, this is Waffle House. We're not talking well, that's about... What I'm saying. The, the, I would say the Waffle House hash browns are much better than average. They're like 8 or 9 out of 10. Everything else at Waffle House is like average, but the hash browns put it a little bit above to make it a 6 out of 10. Mm. Plus the fact that they're open all the time. Plus the, the people who work there are generally pretty nice because they have to put up with some shit. So if you're like mildly nice to them, they'll be really friendly with you. It's, it's pretty nice. They also have chocolate milk. Mm-hmm. Which is a so does the grocery order. store? Yeah, but I don't go to the grocery f- store to get like <laughs> fast food, you know. <laughs> well, you can. Uh, though I will have to say, this is a great diatribe that will not be in the video. It, so, so, oh, it my, is. Yeah. Oh. I'm keeping the waffle. People must know my Waffle House thoughts. I'm sorry if you came here for Will Save the Galaxy for food. I assume from the title you were interested in food. <laughs> yeah, if you didn't know what you were getting into, you can just shove off to IHOP, you yeah. scrub. <laughs> if this is in the video. I, I have to say this is the point at which I cannot steer it back. No, I, I'll, I'll steer it back. Oh, God. Thank I'll, you. I'll steer it back right now with both hands. <laughs> so, yeah, this is overall a pretty good book. Nothing super special, but it's it's decent. I, I would recommend it um, if, if you're looking for just, like, some, some science fiction to read. This is actually much more popcorn than when we said originally, like, The Furies of Calderon. Yeah. It was a very... Furies was very derivative and very, like, oh, yeah, I see this coming... Uh, a lot of stuff in Yahtzee's story kind of just, like, kind of threw me, but not so much that I was like, holy crap, that's something new. It would make an interesting, like, movie or, like, television series or whatever. I'd check it out if they adapted it. I'd watch that, too. I'd still think, I don't know. I think it could have stood to be a little longer, actually, Mm. which is not a argument I make very often, because usually you want people to take stuff out to, like, trim the fat but this is a case where I feel like this book could have added a lot more depth into itself and not have been a burden. Yeah, the characters were fun enough that I could, some of them weren't, but the, the ones that drove the story were fun enough that I would like to have seen them do more, which is why I want to get the next book myself. Yeah, the characters were fun enough, the world was interesting enough, a lot of the history and world building they did, like, I would have, I'd be interested to learn more about but it. But there were no elongated passages about the tax code of... Riketsu City, which no. was a main sticking point against the Ables that you didn't have like this massive tax code recited, you know, in it. And I was, I don't like it. It doesn't explain I, this. I like how you always focus on the tax code whenever we bring up the Ables. Because it wasn't about the tax code. It was just the fact that like these superheroes have a giant infrastructure. How do they get the money for it? Liberal handouts, man. <laughs> Vote blue in your local elections. Down ballot. Well, in the defense of the uh, economy of this book, they do kind of imply it simply by combining all four, well, not four, but like two different currencies together, euro and zen. The, the euro yen. The euro yen to make it just sound like um, like most and, things. And involved. they do explain 
how the lunar colony got built. They go into they, a they little do. bit they, of they, detail, I, big I detail about the history and how he it was does. established and everything and how it makes its money. Which, ironically, I'd like to see a story about that, too, because they're just a just giant... Just about Ritsuko City? Yeah, just a giant middle finger and also <laughs> the awkwardness that is, hey, Ritsuko is my girlfriend, but my wife, Naomi... Yeah, Never he, mind her. He named the city Ritsuko City after his girlfriend, which his wife didn't like at all. <laughs> Oh, well, we're spoiling a joke. We've spoiled That's one a... joke. That's the one joke you get for free, people. Yeah. But yeah, did, did any of you have any other thoughts about, about this before we get into spoiler-free talk? I will say, yeah, yeah, I didn't think about it until you actually said it, but yeah, I feel like if they had put more into the story, it would have been maybe a slightly bit more just like yeah we'll get to that with the spoiler talk because that's actually one of the things i would like to talk about but i can't get into it without explaining mm -hmm. details about the story so yeah if you haven't yet read this and you would like to read it please go do it you can pick it up on amazon brandon would really recommend the the audiobook version mm -hmm. if not you can get like an actual paper version for what was this like five oh twelve bucks i don't <laughs> think i paid that much for it <laughs> That's what it says on the back, but I'm pretty sure I played, paid less. I paid $7.99 for it on my Kindle. Yeah. yeah. You can get it a lot of different ways. Shaporton, he's he's a he's an independent artist. Let, let's put it that way. Yeah. He is probably a millionaire now that I think about it. He lives in California, so I just assume. He emigrates a lot. Only a rich person can afford yeah, the, to do that. The poor independent world traveler yeah. from Australia turned Californian published author, YouTube mega revenue generator. I have no idea. Go buy his book. I mean, that's you, you buy stuff because you like it, not because the person buys it. He's a new and interesting creator. Please do support him. And he is actually putting effort into these stories. Yeah. Thank you, Brandon, for a great plug of my channel. <laughs> So yeah, starting with something a little bit light as we go into our spoiler-filled talk, Pilot Math. Probably one of the more interesting things about this book. I've seen a lot of sci-fi and even fantasy books that try to do cursing in a unique way. You know, they want to have their characters curse, but they don't want to do it in a way that might make their show inappropriate. And this managed to do it in probably the most believable, most fluid way i've ever seen and on top of that they actually put a reason behind it a lot of the times they're just like ah ad frag or this term or that term this one they actually like took the time to sit down and be like so this is what they mean this, this is why they were said yeah this is it's a lot of mathematical terms because pilots hate math so they'll be like what the track is this which is short for for subtract mm -hmm. or and doints doints which... for decimal points Kick me in the fucking doints. Or, I'm sorry, the... What was the, the replace for fucking... Kick me in the plyin' doints. Yeah. Uh, man, I, and I, was, I actually want to start adding some of this to my vernacular because it's actually kind of fun to say. I think, what was the... this? They're like, specifically for females, you use div. Mm -hmm. <laughs> plyin' psycho div. Yeah. And then my favorite one is brackets. Bracket. Ah, brackets. Ah, <laughs> brackets. Like, I don't, it's just an all-purpose one, I believe. Yeah. It just, it works surprisingly well. It didn't come off as cringy. We're probably not doing it justice here, oh, trying definitely. to say it. But it, it just flowed really well. After, like, the first chapter, I really kind of got into it and just, you know, felt, it felt universal. Yeah, it, it, it definitely, uh, like, on the audiobook version, it, it flowed definitely better for him, obviously. Yeah. He, he wrote it. He, he but, wrote it, he could pull it off. But on top of the fact that, like, it just became something that just melded into the background rather well for me, and that was really good. Yeah. Uh, you were going to say? I was going to say, yeah, no, it it, it is universal, because I stopped trying to remember what the translations were, and I just, yeah. it's like, my brain was just like, oh, profanity. Yeah. It's like, you profanity, profanity ship. When he calls Warden like applying psycho div, like you just you just understand yeah, it. Yeah, I'm just like you I know it. he's cussing her out. I don't need to know what he's actually trying to say. Because trying to get the translations, it's like that kind of pulled me out. Because it's like you're in the store and there's this little footnote. Yeah, and I'm like, is this the character like saying this as a footnote, or is this uh, you know Scrabble the author putting this in as a footnote? <laughs> And I'm just like, I that distracted me, but okay, I get it. You gotta explain where these random terms are coming from if you want people to follow it. It's something that, like, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Ringworld... Or not Ringworld, Discworld. Yes. I get those two <laughs> confused. But Discworld and Hitchhiker's Guide will both do that. Where, like, 
they'll have something weird, and then they'll have a little footnote where they're like, for the audience's interpretation, we're going to explain this. So it's like, oh, okay, I, go what we're, I know what we're going for. That's a nice little thing. Um, the weird thing about it was that he only did it once. Right. The entire booklet, and then just never did it again. And uh, again, kind of what I was saying in the spoiler free, I feel like he could have done a little bit more with that. Maybe used it a couple more times to explain, yeah, like, the golden age. Structurally, for me, it was just like, was this the author explaining it for the reader's benefit, or is this, like, the character, like, breaking the fourth wall and turning to the reader, like, oh, by the way... Yeah. So you at home know. I actually see it as kind of an homage to what Joe was saying. A, a little bit, but one of the interesting things is that both Discworld and Hitchhiker's Guide are told in third person. Mm -hmm. So it is especially weird in this where it's all first person from this character, except for that one footnote. And it's like, well, did he put the footnote here? Is this, where is, yeah, is this breaking a, a wall? Point. Is this meta? Or is this like I, the author is just like... I didn't want to get, like, an M rating on my book, so I decided to not put fuck in it and decided to put ply in That's it. That's a nice Yahtzee impression you got there. Spot <laughs> there, on. Spot on. Perfect. Bloody brilliant. The Bob Breaker Voice Acting Academy, now signing up Masterclass students. Please, dear God, Yahtzee, come and watch this video just to hear that. Crikey. He has better things to I know, but I just want one. <laughs> I'm going to throw a cronky in there. I got, I got to bond uh. with him. But yeah, it's one of those things where, like, I feel like we're going to run into the same problem that we always run into when we get a book that's, like, decent, where we can talk about something we liked, but there's not much to say about it other than, yeah, that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more you can talk about with the negative stuff than the, the good stuff. So we're going to talk about a few things that we didn't like, but I just want to make it clear up front, this is not, like, a super harsh criticism. As I said, this book's pretty decent i thought it was six out of ten you guys seem to think it was better than that um so don't don't take this too harshly if you enjoyed this book but yeah so a hero's job is to make themselves unnecessary i feel like that's the core theme of the book if the book had one because that that line seemed to have a lot of weight right it was it, this it big climactic moment where the the old fighter pilot is explaining like look the, the hero's job it's to make themselves unnecessary. I'm like, that's that seems like a kind of a profound line, and it makes sense. It, it was the know? only profound line in the book, so like yeah. I would agree with that. Like, yeah, he was closing on that as the theme, which is was... which is weird because well, for for a number of reasons. First of all, the space pilots aren't necessarily heroes. Jack is like, he does a lot of unheroic things. He does do some heroic things. He gets more heroic as it goes on, mm -hmm. but they go out of their way to describe him as like a cockroach who just does whatever it takes to survive, whatever underhanded things are necessary. Well, yeah, because at the very beginning, he, like, rigs up a tour with, like, a fake pirate attack. Yeah, and, well, they're real pirates, but well, they're... yeah, but, like, it's a staged attack. Yeah. I'd always and he gets rid of all their, their mm. stuff. I'd actually read it as more of that he was a hero, and that through the circumstances that he'd been put in, he'd become a cockroach. Possibly. I don't know, because that's the thing, right, is... They, uh, Warden says later on that she doesn't know what his actual name is because on record he has three different names, which implies that even while he was a space pilot, he was erasing his identities for some reason. He was doing something bad that required him to go off the grid and create a new ID. Actually, it was implied that that was, that it, I never took it as an implied, but it, it felt like it was implied that it was in between the space of when the transports happened to win, and all of the space pilots had become completely useless. And he dicked over a couple people in between there. I don't know, it feels like the Golden Age didn't uh, didn't end that long ago. Like, five, ten years, maybe? Yeah, they're not, they're, I didn't get this impression that, like, all these star pilots are, like, in their 90s sitting around, like... Especially, like, you look at the cover and it's like, he looks like he's in his 40s, assuming he did everything in his 20s. Like, that's a... That's a not very long time to get, like, all this shit done. Yeah, you know, that's it, a good point. I didn't think he was going to... I didn't picture him as a, that old of a character when even, reading this. Even if it is five years, a lot of shit can happen in five years. Yeah. And so <laughs> Three can, identities is a lot, though. Mm -hmm. Three identities is a lot, but the way he kind of moved around, I kind of feel like, yeah. E either way, even if you don't want to look at that, like, he was originally going to be like, yeah, I'll just ransom them off to pirates. 
He didn't want to get the kids involved if he could help it. Mm -hmm. But if he couldn't help it, he would definitely have gotten the kids involved. Like, he was perfectly fine with doing, what, like, whatever needs to be done. Um, but yeah, that that's only one reason why this seems like an odd theme. The other one is, like, the pilots are unnecessary at the start of the story. But not because anything heroic they did. They got replaced due to, like, advancing technology. Mm -hmm. So the idea that, like, the Golden Age ended because they made themselves unnecessary doesn't really, like, fit with the book. And then the third one is, like, there's also the fact that there's several evil entities in the book, like the pirates, like Henderson. There was the, the guy who made the Borg ripoff, what, whatever their name was. Or, the I guess we shouldn't call them a, a ripoff. The Zoobs? The no, no, not the Zoobs. The, the mm. robot cyborgs that were on the, the pleasure planet. The Mechanite thing. Oh, the Malamines or whatever. Yeah, the Malamines. Malamines. That are basically Borg. They're se self-replicating robots. Um, and they, they just have him working for them now um, on this, this uh, theme park planet. So it's like, yeah, there's all this evil kind of around, and the pilots don't seem all that interested in stopping any of it. I mean, I guess they stopped the Malmind guy, but only because he ran out of money, apparently, and needed needed a job. Which seems kind of weird. It doesn't seem like you would it would take a lot of money to be a world-conquering supervillain. Feels mm -hmm. like conquering the worlds would make you money, but it's, it's another part of the, the satire of this. So yeah, it's, it's really weird. This book in general, it has a lot of, you know... That line was a good line. I don't know what it had to do with the rest of the book. I agree. I agree with that. I read that and I'm like, well, I can see that's what he's he's hitting for. Because I normally don't give a shit about, like, themes in the books and, like, looking for deeper meanings. You know, what's the green light in Great Gatsby symbolize? A green light bulb. Move on. Why does it have to mean something? But I could tell because that was, like, the only profound trope of a line in there. You know, I'm like, well, the theme is either... The hero is to exist until he's useless, or they're trying to promote dildo-clad office furniture. Yeah, it's like... You, you, the, the, the people listening have no idea why that is a line that is of any significance Well, 30% to of readers, according to my Kindle app or something like that, underline that line. So apparently, <laughs> dildo office furniture matters. We're okay. in the spoiler zone now, so yes. <laughs> okay, well, um, I actually thought that the underlying theme wasn't so much of a hero is... Uh, Makes is, themselves is unnecessary. unnecessary. My thought was that this was uh, the story of a man chasing a golden age, chasing his uh, peaked years and finding that he should have found something else to do, which he does at the end of the book. Yeah, well, somewhat. I mean, the only goal he gets is, like, handing out money to people who are in the golden years. Right. It's more along the lines of deciding to turn his investments of... Uh, self-reliance and now newfound money to other people as opposed to what he was originally which was self-promoting i don't know because that, that's the thing right is i don't he never stated like oh i've got this money now i'm going to retire nothing changed i think that was his plan as soon as he got the money mm -hmm. i think he was always planning to like give it away because while he does need the money to live for food and stuff like that and he would like a new rocket ship he's He's not like, I'm going to go retire to this planet and live in the lap of luxury. It doesn't seem to interest him. But that actually I, I thought it kind of did, because I thought he was just like, I got all this money. I could just leave and yeah. get away from everything now. I can't remember if he said anything. I mean, he, he could get away from it, but I don't I can think... go into the black now with you yeah. know, this cabillion euro yen. But the thoughts, my, my thought was that this was the story of a character slowly going from the... Uh, the bottom rock bottom that he was and trying to get back to a point he was not trying he was forced to get back to being a good person that he was and that's i feel like uh, epitomized by the fact that he doesn't run from uh the police that like arrest him at the end of the book he actually does the full circle from being like oh shit i'm gonna get out of here blow out of town to finally being like, you know what? I'm going to face my consequences. I'm going to be a good person. So you could say he went from zero to hero. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's what they were going for. I don't know. It, it seems, I guess then the theme would be like, you know, the environment makes the person. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're an environment that allows you to be heroic, people will be heroic. If you're in a position to do so. If you're in a position where you just need to get food... 
you'll do kind of whatever it takes to get food, whatever it takes to survive. Which I that that is like a, a valid. It's one of those things I, I have written here where I'm like, it it has the potential for all these themes and doesn't explore them. There is some like going into this, I thought they were going to say something about it, like capitalism or if if not that like mechanization or the fact that people can become useless through no fault of their own just because technology advances he makes a couple of passing like lines where it looks like he could have gone in that direction and yeah. then he just kind of like lets it hang there i'm like oh i get that He's social commentary and then he just leaves it i feel like he could have done you know you, you don't have to be preachy you don't have to make a big thing about it but i feel like the it could have been a little bit more obvious if that was what he was going for because it isn't until Brandon explained that that I kind of thought about it. And even when he explained it, he didn't think that was the theme. He thought the theme was something else. Because one of the other themes that I'm like, they kind of almost brought up and then left hanging was this whole idea of nostalgia, right? Like, he thinks the golden age was like this. And then he gets confronted with this theme park version of it. And sort of realizes maybe it wasn't quite exactly how he thought it was. I don't know. He does. He doesn't really do that. He he doesn't really go back and like reevaluate the golden age at any point. He just sort of like, you know, this makes a mockery of it, and I don't like it. And the other guy's like, look, this is all we got now. Mm -hmm. We can tell our stories and try to make ourselves seem better than we were, which could have done a theme about like you know the history is written by whoever's left or something. There's just all these these lines where you could have done something a little bit more profound just a tiny bit more and he he didn't push any of them really instead he wanted to have zoobs and funny <laughs> is, it, is it it's not just me right it's really weird that like the main antagonist of the climax was introduced halfway through the story and didn't have anything to do with like the pilots really and could just be beaten with a crowbar <laughs> and make well, them explode them. into clouds of spores the first one did i have a feeling that's going to come back in the future one <laughs> He's going to have spores in him or something. Maybe, because he does make that point. He's like, you know, I wouldn't breathe those in for, like, no reason in particular. Yeah. yeah. It's like, they might be spores. I'm like, they're gelatinous life forms. Like, why would they be spores? They lived underwater, which is where spores don't want to live. I think they, they said they it came from a water planet originally. Did they? I, I didn't if I'm not there. mistaken. It's also completely alien. So we don't yeah, know. That's true. You can say. But world building, you, world. we need a, a zoological database file footnote <laughs> in there. I mean, They I, did. They kind of spent some time explaining where the zoobs came from. I do like the fact that they have taken this idea of like the uh, alien sidekick and they were just like, guess what? They will eat you if you don't look, if you don't Yeah, when them the high. pilots ran out of food and they got hungry, they turned against the pilots. Mm. I just, I, I kept thinking of the pack leads from Star Trek The Next yeah, Generation. Yeah. Like, you fix ship, make us go. Meat? Food? You meat? You food? food? <laughs> Admittedly, you know, like the, the first encounter with a Zoob when I heard it on the book, I was just kind of like... That's some nightmare fuel shit. Yeah, because right yeah, it's all, then it's also like the Vidians where they're like pulling faces off of people in Voyager. They're like wearing like, a human face, or they have like a human arm mm -hmm. taped to them because of their video script. They're they're piloting these ships that are like derelict and old and shit. So the video screens are all fuzzy. And they're like, I think that's a human. And then it got possibly. closer, and then I realized it was a human face. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> not attached to a human. That's why I was kind of like... to a Lovecraftian goo monster. <laughs> that's basically it. I was just like, I don't want any of this. Yeah, I be... mean, I'll give it to... The Zoobs are a good antagonist. It just would have been nice if, like, maybe the main character had a Zoob that he had to sell. And then later off you find out, like, you were right to have done that. <laughs> mm -hmm. You could have... There, there's, again, just so many missed opportunities with this. Like, you could have introduced the Zoobs. I think they could have, what would have been really nice would be to see a little bit, like a glimpse of the Golden Age. Mm -hmm. Like if the first chapter, instead of being a paragraph where he described Cantabite or whatever the, the town was, <laughs> what was the name of the planet? Do you remember? I, it's, I don't remember, Raketsu City or something, but like you were just saying Cantobite because that's from Star yeah. Wars and I've been thinking about Cantobite too this whole I, time. I believe it had bite on it. Do you remember, Brandon? Which is sad because it's the stupidest part in that movie. <laughs> no, I got nothing. Cantra Bargid is what Actually, it's called. Cantra Bargage. Okay, whatever. Yeah, you were the one that listened to it. How did he say it? <laughs> Cantra Bargage. Cantra Bargid. Either way, he, he spends the first paragraph, like, explaining how he was fighting cyborgs on the surface. And then it immediately becomes clear that 
this is just him telling a family or whatever. Mm-hmm. But you never really get a really good glimpse at what the Golden Age was really like. It's like a split second, and then it's like gone. Which which makes me like, why am I supposed to like care about the Golden Age if you don't talk about it and set it up? Like, yeah. why was it the Golden Age? It's just like everybody had work, and then they lost it because of automation. Like, <laughs> bank tellers lost some jobs because of ATMs, but we don't talk about Golden Age novels of Golden Age of coal mining. Yeah, like. <laughs> Admittedly, it is also because he kind of shoehorned himself at the very beginning of the book to making it uh, 90%, because there's that little 10% uh, snippet of first person. Yeah. He did. Uh, he decided not to at the beginning uh, add maybe a third person um, uh, third person omniscient part that would be like that, and then go into the I, first person. I don't, I don't think you, you needed even the third person. I think you could have just had, like, the first chapter is, like, you know, him... Like, the first chapter, very serious. Him on this planet fighting against cyborgs. And you're like, oh, I thought this was a satire, but we're having an action scene. He's going into this. And then, like, you end the chapter with, like, it zooms out and he's telling this to, like, a bored teenager who doesn't care. Mm. (laughs) It's like, that would have been much more effective than a, a, a paragraph of it, followed by this pirate chase that tries to be an action scene, but even during it, you're like, I don't think this is actually pirates or anything. Yeah, I'm just like, I don't think this is actually, like, there's not stakes here. Yeah. I don't really care that much about this character yet or anything. But, um, yeah, either that or you could have just had him, like, you know, they could have read a snippet from Jack McEwen's book and talked about how... it. It's one of those things where it's, it's not until they get to the theme park and you see kind of like an example of the Golden Age... That it finally, like, clicked in my head, like, oh, that's what they're going for. He's, like, Flash Gordon-esque kind of guy. I mean, I understand what you're saying, but I don't think they should give any more money to Jack McKeown by reading a piece of his book <laughs> in his book. Well, all the money goes to space pilots. It's fine. No. Now. <laughs> now. <laughs> now it is. But, um, speaking of which, moving on to another topic, you had pacing written down. I... You guys talked about this earlier, that you didn't really enjoy the pacing. It felt like it dragged at the beginning. but The, the whole first beginning. I think Henderson is like an awful villain. And yeah. yeah that, that is a point for later. But um, when Yahtzee reads it on the actual audiobook, the pacing kind of just kind of snowballs. It starts off when he gets that uh, communication, and it just starts building slightly from there. Not in a Not in a different way, obviously, from the book, but the way he reads it, he kind of just keeps the pacing amping up and i really did appreciate that he keeps your interest with his voice and everything Mm -hmm. yeah because reading it book wise and there were a couple people on the the discord who said this as well in fact there were two people who read this book and one of them was like yeah the, the first half was a little slow but i got it and the other guy was like yeah i got to the point where henderson was showing them the god of whale sharks or whatever and i just stopped reading because i wasn't interested Mm -hmm. like they just left at that point and i'm like yeah, I kind of get it. It's very slow. You think it's going to become like, you know, this guy taking this other guy's son for a tour around the galaxy and trying not to get killed by a businessman. Which is not the most interesting story. I think I understand why him reading it makes the pacing a little bit better, because Yahtzee can write dialogue. Yeah, I guess maybe hearing him actually say the dialogue out loud. I'm really curious, because, um... Obviously, he's he wrote his other books, but I think this was written specifically as an audiobook. Mm-hmm. So perhaps he, like with me, where I, I've been writing my Lefty, um, where I'm specifically writing it to read out loud, it might work a lot better as a written, as a spoken work than a written work. Mm-hmm. But he still released it as a book, so that's that's not an excuse. Because <laughs> fuck the environment, ply the environment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I will say, again, I want to reiterate, he does write really good dialogue. It felt somewhat natural yeah for the most part i don't think there was ever a part where like not the characters felt bad or false except for maybe henderson and that's just because where everyone else is kind of like a complex character even daniel and jemima had some complexity to them henderson is like he's just evil he's just an evil dude who likes sweaters because it's quirky and his son he likes his son yeah he likes his son but yeah the sweaters thing i just Again, I forgot he was wearing a sweater. And then, yeah. like, I, I kind of skimmed over that at the beginning when, you know, they're like, oh, this man in the alley wearing a sweater. 
And it's like, okay, why is that relevant? And then, it, like, it wasn't for the whole f- plying book until the very end yeah. where he's just like, and he's he's ditched the sweater now. And I'm just like. So you know he's serious. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. He was wearing the sweater earlier. He was wearing Christmas sweaters, oddly. He's, he didn't want, he wanted his, his bad guy to be a stereotypical businessman, but didn't want to put him in a business suit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because instead, Carlos wore the suit. Yeah, also the fact that if you took him out of the suit and put him in something that was even more wacky, as, say, like, a Christmas sweater, it would add this kind of bit of insanity to him. Yeah, it just makes him seem a little bit more insane. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Carlos, there was a guy on the Discord who's like, I I don't know if it's just me, but I can't help but imagine Carlos as being Gossamer from Looney Tunes, who, if you don't know, (laughs) is the big red thing. It's like all fur and like you can't see his hands. Oddly enough, I saw something different. I like the if anybody is here has seen the uh, Into the Spider Verse. I have not. I know of it. When the way that they designed Kingpin in that film, he's basically just uh, the screen blacked out with like his head dropped down. He's just a giant square. Yeah, with huge arms, I assume. Yeah, that's what I kind of pictured him as. Well, that's how they described him. It's literally just a block with arms. Yeah, yeah. That's I, I don't know why the guy thought like Gossamer because he's like, why is it that everyone seems to get this? And I'm like, I don't think everyone does. I'm not... I think you're the only person he's described as wearing a suit. He's described as having like his outline is shaped almost like an M because his shoulders <laughs> are hunched up and he's got these huge arms. I imagine him more like, if you've ever seen the Puppet Master movies, Nope. Yeah. there's a puppet with a pinhead. I believe his name might be Pinhead. Let I, me see real quick. I doubt it, since that would be franchise infringement. That guy. <laughs> yeah. I also pictured him as uh, basically... That's a, not far off. Like, yeah, I, I could see that. I also pictured him as a, a gorilla stuffed into a suit. Yeah. It's just, just basically a big gorilla guy. He was a good, intimidating uh, presence. He was, he was absolutely fan- no dialogue. He was no. a fantastic goon because, like, yeah, yeah, he's a big dude. Okay, and then he just jumps out of a ship and then... Yeah, did like, they ever suggest, like, how he breathes in space? I don't think he's human. Yeah. I think he's some kind of alien. I actually thought he was more like an android that he employed. Could be. Yeah, he just jumps out of the ship, punches holes in another ship with his bare fucking hands... And then they just have, like, audio from the ship, and you just hear screaming, like, what's going on over there? They, like, open fire on him with lasers and guns and shit, and he's just, like, he, flying He kick flips off of a um, torpedo. Yeah. Actually, admittedly, if he was an android, the oob, the, the zoobs wouldn't be care- wouldn't care Right. Yeah, he it. did bleed, so mm. he's, he's but some that kind means, of alien. That means you can kill it. Yeah. If it bleeds, mm. I can, can kill, kill it. it. If you make a god bleed... People will cease to believe in it. Yeah, speaking of the villains, though, another thing that Brandon had marked down, which I, I don't quite agree with, uh, Warden felt more like a threat than Henderson did. I mean, because Warden, you didn't know what she was going to do. Henderson, pretty straightforward. He's going to kill you. Warden, you didn't know if she was going to kill you, sh- shoot your leg off, call <laughs> the bad guy in for no fucking reason. She had for the a reason. Fourth, I don't care. <laughs> they were dumb reasons each and every time. She needs to stop making decisions. I don't know. I, I mean, everything worked out for her, so I, I think it is. Because it, she's mm, plot armor. She, she's she's, she's got, a plumber? What did you say? Plot armor. She was <laughs> infuriating. <laughs> Warden's decision making was infuriating, and I, I felt every time that Jack was just like, Why? <laughs> It's like she's like I'm making plans. I'm like no, you're making fucking long shots, brackets, see, long shots, whatever. No, see that that's the thing though. Is like Jack made a whole lot of long shots too. <laughs> there were just as many times where I'm like, why aren't you throwing out your phone? Why did you answer the phone? Mm-hmm. Why are you doing all? They're both like that's why she never felt like an antagonist. Mm-hmm. They both had the same goal. They just couldn't agree about how to do it. It's the Wheel of Time all over again. Admittedly, I'm not saying that I didn't like Warden. I'm just like, her... I felt every time Jack was just like, Why? (laughs) To be fair, it's told from Jack's perspective, so he's more critical of other people's mistakes than his own. No, admittedly, when he answered that phone, I was also in the peanut gallery going like, (laughs) Why? (laughs) You stupid Yeah, I, I... Yeah... I, he answered the phone, I'm like, because the whole point is like, ah, I wouldn't want him to track us. 
Oh, let me just answer my tracking device. Yeah. <laughs> Admittedly, also, the moment he was like, I'll give you the gun. I was like, why? <laughs> this you, is dumb. You They're have making... any any last words, Drebin? Yes. Can I have the mm-hmm. gun? <laughs> <laughs> well, you asked politely. <laughs> Might as well. Mm-hmm. I don't think, again, it's, she didn't feel like an antagonist. It always... I didn't, I'm saying she wasn't an antagonist. I yeah. just thought of her as more of a threat than Henderson was. <laughs> because she was going to pull some sideways trick that she didn't really think through as well as either one of the characters did. She's going to be like, oh, I made, the, I made the calculation. No, you didn't. You just got lucky. <laughs> Oh, I see. I might have made the calculation. I didn't think of her like that. I thought of her as the cold, like calculating. Oh no, she was drone. Cold. She was cold and calculating, she, but she was also entirely out of her element. She was. That's yeah. what. But she she survived long enough on the New Republic that yeah. she can she can. It doesn't matter what her element is. She will figure it out. She was a nanny. <laughs> yeah, and then she became the the, uh, the head of whatever. lunar colony yeah. acquisitions. <laughs> Yes. And As a scapegoat, yes, but... That scapegoat is going to make a really nice, like, veal. Hey, she found Jack McEwen. The Jack... No one else could have found him, all right? Well... I hate everything <laughs> you're saying about her. She's... she's she, I think, if anything, the uh, the interesting point about her is that she's every much... Every bit the cockroach that Jack is and just doesn't seem to realize mm-hmm. that she's in the same position where, like... She will just do whatever it takes to survive, where it's like, if I'm running from Henderson, I will double-cross yeah, this pilot I've hired she, she and kidnap it, the kids. She does whatever she needs to survive, but with a stick up her butt the whole yeah. time. <laughs> I was, you were half a second faster than I was actually going to blow that out. But yeah, like, and that actually kind of made their, uh, their on-again, off, their, not really on-again, off-again, but not their sexual tension. Yeah, like I was in the, the absence whole, of sexual. tension. Yeah, I was gonna say like the, the, I I got very little like sexual tension between them until she just throws that random line in there. She's like, "Hey, before we make this trebuchet jump, let's have sex." <laughs> and in my mind, I'm like, "Wait a minute, how much time is there? Like, I I could be quick, but like how <laughs> how quick are we going here? If like we're this close to the jump, and like by the time you get disrobed, and like what are you gonna do? And like." Four seconds before this jump. I mean, she's calculating, all right? She's yeah. planned this out She to doesn't the know second. how long it's going to take him to space come. <laughs> I, but she thinks she knows. I'm sad that I actually made this conversation a piece. But uh, I was just talking about the, the, the point that they simultaneously did not have any... Uh, relate, uh, chemistry? I'm just saying that they simultaneously didn't have any chemistry at the same time as that they had really good chemistry. They had chemistry, just not in any romantic or exactly, sexual sense. Exactly, like I, I, I almost like thought of that as like he was make almost making a point to not, like, make it a relationship or a sexual thing, and then that's why it was such a jarring line for her to just be like, "Let's have sex," and it, then he's like, I, then, but then she he like even hammers it home further. She's like, "Oh, I don't like you at all. How could I? I don't even know who you are. I just want to. I think we should just fuck because you're obviously." Stressed. You're obviously stressed. You're stressed. I'm stressed. This is a tactical. And she's movie. like, "I'll I'll have sex with you because it will it'll improve our odds of surviving, not because I want to." Yeah. I'll have sex with you for the mission. Yeah, exactly. And I'm just like, "You're why? Like, is this it, supposed to be a humor point, or that, it's like because that, that just jars away from like you had this whole thing where it was like you've got a male and a female like pair." And you don't need the, like, it doesn't always have to be, like, a oh, who can we thing. get our clothes off first? <laughs> and then it's just out of nowhere. You almost, like, because he almost intentionally hammers the point home that he's avoiding any, like, sexual tension by just bringing that up. See, that, but it, it's one of the, the few moments where I thought the satire was kind of on point. Mm-hmm. Because it wasn't just satiring something so specific as 1950s starfighter fiction, pulpy stuff. It was specifically satirizing the fact that, like, in any other situation, these two would have some kind of romantic chemistry. Mm-hmm. And they almost, she almost seems aware of it. Like, shouldn't we be having sex right about now? <laughs> Doesn't that seem like something to do to relieve the tension? And he's like, fuck off, I don't find you attractive, you psycho diff. <laughs> like, you just need to calm down, all right? I think I'm a little uh, problematic because I kind of found her uh, attractive. Because I have a problem. <laughs> 
Ah, oh, she 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 seems interested. To be fair, I like the type who are like really work oriented. Mm. I'm I'm very much for for like a girl who who um has a lot on her plate who's doing a whole bunch of stuff. I, I find that really uh, interesting. As opposed to, to be fair, I've dated a lot of girls who are like, yeah, I just sort of work fast food and sit around my house and my hobbies include getting more dogs and cats. <laughs> Except for the animals, that's you. Like that sounds like a match made in heaven. I I have my own <laughs> company. <laughs> not not at the not. Then I run you didn't. four channels. Not then you didn't. No, I did, but I had aspirations even when I worked fast food. I was working on novels and stuff. I like someone who has ambition. So ladies, out ladies there, out there, yeah. All you got to do is blow a guy's leg off, and you've already got a. Okay. No, that, 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 that that's not the part that you were like. That's the thing that actually uh, got me away from her because I'm like. You know, I felt like Thanos in that moment. I'm like, aim for the head! Right. Why didn't you kill fucking Henderson? If you're gonna shoot him, just do it. He will kill you, and even if not you, he will kill lots of others. I mean, admittedly, he does probably have contingencies in the sense that the person he is killed by is now officially being paid. A lot of people are being paid to kill her. I don't know. Whoever takes over his companies is probably happy that he's dead. He's and not dead. also, if he if he get, did get oh, shot, okay. he, I'm saying this. Conti- Plus, it's like you know, whether you kill him or blow his leg off, he's going to want to want you dead, or his descendants are. Better not to have him do it because he's clearly been very successful at killing people. Maybe whoever takes over for him won't be as good at it. Well, do, do we do we think Daniel finally gets clued in that it was real? When he sees his dad without a leg now at the end. Oh, God, no. Or does Daniel still think, Oh, my God, you really went all out. You, you got your <laughs> you leg cut off, off just for leg. me. Yeah. Daniel has mud for brains. Here, here's well, so, again, again, we, again like, I read him as a completely different attitude and character than apparently Yahtzee voiced him and like drew him up as. Yeah, apparently Yahtzee voiced him as like derpy hooves. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so essentially. He died. Having a phony old time. And I was just like, no, he's just energetic child, just like embarrassed by his dad. <laughs> Danny is my least favorite character. <laughs> like, I actually enjoyed Henderson because when the way he voiced him sounded like he was a man on the edge of being like, he went from being like, oh, Danny, it's so nice to see you. I will slit your fucking throat. <laughs> see, I that's just not how I got Henderson. And like, maybe just not the voice. I pictured him more as like a Lex Luthor type, yeah, bad guy where he's like, you know, villains are all sitting around the table, and Luthor just comes, puts his arms around, he's like, Joker, Let me talk to you, Grod. We're gonna have a talk, and this is how it's gonna be. It's, it's one of those things where, like, you know, they you made your villain a business suit wearing guy. Mm-hmm. Or not, he didn't wear a bit. You made you made him a businessman. It doesn't matter that you. Put him in a sweater. Doesn't matter that he had like a hawk talon thing or they had all these quirks. I'm still always going to imagine him in a suit right. being a deep voice intimidating right. and bald I just man. Kept, I just kept thinking of Jurassic Park where he's frightening the kid at the beginning with the claws like, and the raptor claw. They come and slice your <laughs> stomach open. You don't open. have to stab me. Ow. I just cut my nails today. They're not <laughs> sharp. I was actually going to say, oh, uh, to derail a slight bit, uh, what is the Bond villain from The Simpsons called? Hank Scorpio. Scorpio. Yes. I pictured him as a uh, inverse version of Scorpio, Hank Scorpio from The Simpsons, basically because, like, Hank Scorpio was like, hey, I'm a fun guy, but I also kill people. You want some sugar? I got some sugar around here somewhere. You want any cream for that? Uh, no. (laughs) Whereas this guy felt like, and when he was reading him, it felt like a guy who was, like, pretending all the time to be nice. Yeah. (laughs) But he was also just like, I like to kill people. Barely contain psychosis. Mm-hmm, yeah, like that's the way he was read to me in this book. I contain what... psychosis for my son's sake. But yeah, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Danny comes in. And he's like, "Whoa, did you bro blow your leg off?" And he's like, "No, it's all just a joke for the thing." <laughs> Yeah, that's why I'm kind of like... An accident, son. Don't worry your head. I don't want you to get stressed. Danny is, again, my least favorite character because he's also just like, oh. I, I think Yahtzee realized that because he gagged him half the way through, didn't right. invite him down on the planet, and then had him go canatonic for the last half <laughs> of the story. Admittedly, like... And even then, he didn't have character development. He, oh, yes, he did. Sorry, sorry, sorry. He did thank his father, which was very nice. Right. Uh, but for he, something his father didn't do. Yeah. Well, he did do <laughs> Not it. Not on but, purpose. Yeah. Right. And that was just like, oh, we're actually going to like, 
I almost was like, oh, we're going to have a slightly redeeming moment for Henderson where he's just going to be like, nah, you know what? You guys are okay. You you can be on your way. He did. And then he did. But then like, he took it all back when, when, uh, Warden just blew his leg <laughs> off and I'm just like, oh, God damn. That was like the one point where I was just like, oh, God damn it, Warden. You <laughs> fucked up the moment. And I'm just like... It's funny because you're like, you fucked it up by shooting him. And I'm like, you fucked it up by shooting the leg, right. not the head. I'm, right. I'm like, you fucked it up by being like, let's kidnap the children. <laughs> like, you could have... They could have... Mm, to be mm, fair, again, Warden fucked Jacques up everything. was going to kidnap the children. And then he was like, wait, I can, I can still ransom them off without kidnapping the children. <laughs> I can trick them into thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's again, like, the... Uh, Speaking of children, do we want to jump on to Jemima at all? I have no strong thoughts of her either way. She just felt like she was kind of there. She was a pretty good character. Actually, no. I really liked the fact that she started off as this, like, who, what? The Jemima? What? Okay, whatever. And then she became like, oh, she gets development. She yeah. did. It was just distracting that that was her name. Yeah. yeah. I'm a, I, Especially I'm given a... now that, like, Aunt Jemima doesn't even exist now. It's like Pearl Mill Company... It, it's weird because it's just the only Jemima I've ever heard of. I didn't know that was like a real name anymore. Yeah. I just didn't find it distracting. I just saw the character go from this like, uh, she in actually on the planet she was kind of annoying because you know, she was, first off she was captured that wasn't that big of a problem, but then she doesn't decide to tell him that this is all an act. I think she kind of thought that he figured it out because it's one of those things where you're a teenager and you're like. The adults aren't stupider than me, right? Yeah, it's like <laughs> they figured out. If the I know, stuff. if I know what's going on, then surely he's in on it too. Well, like, no, she was informed of it. She didn't figure it out. She, she was informed. She they, was informed because she figured it out. They talk about she started she, asking questions yeah, well, and she, stuff. She longer. noticed that the force field was just like LED lights and a fan or something to make and noise. She's like, hey, we could get out there. Like, no, it's it's just a thing. <laughs> but they didn't take her aside. They, they wanted her to experience it too. It was only afterwards they're like, "Yeah, this is just a th- just play along." <laughs> mm-hmm. And it just I don't know, like. But then she became this character that actually had like emotional beats. Uh, her mother's a terrible person, um, and, and she's and, a U.S. president. And they're all terrible people. Yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> ah! We're not getting into your political channel. We try and. Like try and steer right, away we got it. I've, I've mentioned I've I already, mentioned that and I mentioned capitalism already. I already plugged the political channel for him. Mission accomplished. God, I yeah. hate that this is an Thank you, Mr. Video. President. It's just called Hard Leg, by the way, if you're curious. If you look up Hard Leg, you'll find the political channel. But anyway, <laughs> there is one last point I wanted to talk about, which is one of the big things because, I don't know, maybe it's just because it says on the cover, a satirical sci-fi adventure. But I, I really went in expecting a lot stronger satire. And I can't tell if, like, the satire wasn't good or if it was satirizing something I haven't seen before. Because it's one of those things where I really got the idea that this was based off, like, you know, John Carter of Mars, Flash Gordon, Adam Strange, these rogue dashing pilots from the 1950s serials and, like, Pulp, pulp, not Pulp Fiction, because that's a different <laughs> movie, but Pulp Science Fiction stories. You know, I got the idea, but uh, reading this, I didn't really get the feeling that it was like that at all until they got onto the planet. And even then, it was like a lot different from what I understood. Granted, I've never seen any of those movies. I've never read them. I only know about them based off of you know, cultural osmosis. Just, like, it gets parodied in other stuff. I've seen Duck Dodgers of the 25th century, you know. I, I actually would say the satire was pretty solid on those those first few chapters because it actually uh, did satirical looks at, like, uh, usually in these type of stories, Earth isn't maybe, like, a paradise, but it is usually, like, a decent base to go back to. And in this story, Earth is the least important place <laughs> to go to. On top of the fact that, like, your usual typical, like, space stations are based off of, like, a scientist. This is the, the, uh, Jackson Hewitt, or what, I don't fucking care. <laughs> the bank station? Shut up. Uh, this is the Albert the, Einstein this station. Is, this is the this, Tesla station. Salvation this, is usually based station. Off, this is usually based off of a scientist. This is the John McCarmack, uh, space <laughs> station, um, 
uh, or something like that. But no, this one's just like, hey, my Japanese girlfriend that I brought off of, like, that I, uh, like, fool around with instead of my wife, this is what I'm going to name the station after. Or the fact that they call different parts of the station, like, the leg, the, uh... Reach goes heart. Yeah, and he's... The spin- center. He's- and they have, yeah. But it's... It, I don't know. It, it's it felt- it's certainly different, but it just felt like, you know, this could have existed in any sci-fi world building. It didn't feel like it was really jutting the norms too hard. Like, it's it's definitely a little sillier than I would have expected from, like, Star Trek or something. But I could see a, a, a fictional world where, like, yeah, the city is just named after the engineer's girlfriend. There, there are real cities that are like that. Well, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. There's the, the whole new that whole new Star Trek show, the Lower Decks, the yeah. animated one, where it, it does take that whole different approach. To like, yeah, you know, the Star Trek universe isn't just what you see on the bridge with all these dignified officers. Like, there's gonna be immature people making poop jokes down in the lower decks. That <laughs> in you the know, poop deck? I, I took the turbo lift into that one. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no, I feel like the satire is a little bit more subtly baked in in this story. Yeah, it's one of those things, like I said, where I feel like if you you aren't a big fan of those kinds of stories, the old pulp stories, I'm not sure if it'll really hit all that hard. And it makes me wonder, like, I don't know, I, I guess if that's what you want to write for, like people who are fans of these niche science fiction 50s stories. Which I am. You haven't read John. You've just seen the movies occasionally. I like pulp stuff, though. You should yeah. have bought the comic at the store today, Deja Thoris versus John Carpenter of Mars. John Carpenter? Yeah. <laughs> John <laughs> Carter. John <laughs> Carpenter is the guy who made Halloween and the thing. <laughs> and the, the Transformers. It's, he Transformers. also made Ghosts of Mars, so I guess that's the John Carpenter <laughs> of Mars. <laughs> 1.30 in the morning. Uh, forgive me if some of my John Carr names run together. <laughs> John uh, Carmack, John Carter, and John <laughs> Carpenter all get together in a bar. I don't know. The punchline. They get into a John Carr together. <laughs> the bathroom I, car. It's a John it, Carr. For me, though, I didn't get satire at all. Like, I went into it expecting it. And it's just like, I don't know. Maybe in my mind, satire is supposed to be, like, funny. And, like... <laughs> Because it's like parody, mockery, you know, when you look up what the definition actually is of a satire, and I just didn't feel like this was parody in anything. It was just like a generic sci-fi adventure with like crime syndicate thrown into it for no reason. It, like, it, it was... what is this parody and what is this making a mockery of? I'm just like, you know, yeah, there's those like golden age moments where it's like you were saying you throw back to... Uh, Buck Rogers and crap, and I'm like, that's not. You can't just throw a passing reference into it here and there and call the whole thing a satire. Like, I don't know if he just wanted to lure more people in, or if he just thought he was being more satirical than he was. Because it didn't come off satire to me at all. I'm just like, sci-fi adventure, kidnapping, crime syndicate. It, it was certainly quirky. Mm-hmm. It, there were it elements had, of it. Yeah, yes, it's quirky. It, it, it was different. It didn't take itself entirely seriously. I'm just not sure if, like, satire, because it's like, what were you really that, that, saying about right. those things? Like, what what were you parodying with, like, the Zoobs? Or what were you parodying with, you know, Henderson? Or, or, or you know, a, 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 a um, key part of satire is usually it's trying to, like, say something or criticize something. Right. So it's like, what were you saying about these old things that, like, oh, well... As soon as we invent teleportation, they're going to be out of a job. Yeah, like, is that... That like, felt more like a satire of modern day. Right, or, like, you know, he makes a... I, I picked up a couple of comments, like, on the social, like, justice... Not social justice, but, like, um... I don't know the word, but we were just, like, talking about Earth, or he's like, man, it's so polluted now that you've got, like, fans blowing air around, causing more problems with Earth, like, running out of its yeah. precious fuel. I'm like... Social commentary, yeah, that's the word. Like, putting social commentary doesn't mean, like, you're making a mockery or a satire. It's just you're making a reference, you know. So, I don't know. I didn't agree with calling it a satire. Regular sci-fi does that. Just sort of talking about the future of Earth. That's what I said. It doesn't... (laughs) So, I said it doesn't really feel like a satire. It just feels like that's the world building. In this Mm -hmm. future, the climate change that we're dealing with now has destroyed most of the Earth. And everything is under a... 
basically everything's under a fascist government and it's them versus the corporations where they're like everyone's under constant surveillance either the government is watching you to make sure you're not doing something bad or a company is watching you to figure out what they can sell you and you know i i do like though where he kind of is just like yeah it's all this pollution layer and the like one main city is just a bunch of hovering fans are blowing the smoke <laughs> yeah. away and i'm like you know that would be the exact fucking solution like we would come up with is just like what if we just blew the pollution around the city what if we move the pollution yeah. somewhere else so it's yeah. like that would like I, I bought into that hardcore I'm like you know what I yeah. can picture that it's stupid but America and the world is stupid so I can get I that would be it, what would happen it goes back to the the missed opportunity stuff right where it's like you could have said a lot about, like, you could have leaned into that. I think it would have been more mm -hmm. interesting if you talked more about Earth and, like, what happened to it and how their bureaucracy is their it, downfall. Instead, they're just a bureaucratic, xenophobic society now. Yeah. In... And they just kind of, like, fuck off for a while yeah. for it and don't really bring it up again until the end. Where Warden has her big moment that's one of the weirdest climaxes <laughs> character where she's arts. Like, go where she's going through the legal, like, loopholes. Codes, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I dig that, though. Like, that was actually fun for me because I'm just, like, I love, like, Boston Legal or, like, <laughs> legal comedy. And I was, get, I was getting a kick out of that passage. Like, well, actually, according to these legal loopholes, because, again, that's also how the world is now. So maybe he was – I could get behind satire and, like, the litigious nature of society. Where he's like, well, actually, according to this loophole, your soldiers must wear, like – uh, you know, slippers on their feet so they don't scuff the floor because that's considered damage. This is considered an embassy. Right, and they must wear, and then he talks about like, and yeah, I noticed all those soldiers were wearing, you know, uh, paper bags over their shoes when they boarded the station. <laughs> Admittedly, my favorite satire was the John Carter of Mars type guys because it's just this idea of like, ah, yes, we're in a technological age. Why are you wearing a loincloth? Why is there a fire inside of your ship? <laughs> Like, they never did explain that. Ship. They never did explain the fire in the ship. Well, he just no, had a he, fireplace uh, in the yeah, back of his had, ship. <laughs> he had two braziers basically in the back there, just being like, "I That's want a porn ambience. site." Conan the space the space barbarian. Mm -hmm. You haven't read enough Wheel of Time. You don't know what a brazier is. It's fun. But yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, you know, maybe we read this wrong. I it says a satirical sci-fi adventure, and I assume that it was a satire of sci-fi adventure. Okay. But it's possible there should be a comma there, where it's like, it's a satire of the modern world in a sci-fi adventure. Because everything we've been talking about is much more satirical of our modern world than it is anything to do with the sci-fi. We went in expecting a parody of Buck Rogers, and it's more trying to be a reflection of modern day. Which it does do better than it does parodying stuff. But again, it didn't lean into it enough for for my taste personally. Yeah, like either way, like I you might be on to more of that, but yeah. it's still, it's still, it's just like I don't know. I just expected it's just two hours in. We're if, like, if that's literally the second like word of your tagline, <laughs> like uh, have more heavy handed, more like explain like how is this a satire yeah. don't just call it a satire it, it, that's another weird thing where it's like i don't think i've ever read a book before where i was like you're being too subtle usually people hit you over the head with stuff and this time it's like i think i, I could have been hit a little bit harder you know hitchhiker's guide managed to do that really well where it could make fun of modern politicians and stuff modern at the time in the 70s or whatever or modern ideas and just do it in a really funny way. And I almost feel like this was trying to hold back. But there's also a chance that, like, we're two hours, like, after talking to this. And, like, maybe we missed the point entirely. Maybe <laughs> maybe this just went over our heads and we were looking at it too dumb. Somebody please. call up Monopoly and ask him which which it is. Yeah. Are we please, on to it or were we on to it before? Please do contact Yahtzee so that he can be like, you're all fucking crazy. Yeah, I'm sure he'll love in his busy schedule of weekly reviews and writing books and making games to sit down and listen to us talk for two hours about how we don't think his writing is very good. As if we've written anything. I don't know. Maybe he'll enjoy it. I, I, I guess comment if you do. Comment either way. Let we'll us know what you thought about this book. We'll pin your comment, Yahtzee. Yeah. Whatever you want to say, you can call us, like, poopy doo-doo heads. But you... make that in math terms. <laughs> Use the pilot math. We learned it. You have to learn it well. And thank you for saying his name right. You've been using other board games the entire time. I'm not, not sure a... if anyone in the comments noticed. I, it's not even board games. That is, is Yahtzee is just a dice game. It's not a board... Whatever. I'm you just... play it you can... on a board. No, you don't. You play it on a table. 
which is a board. Yeah. No. By definition. No. Yes. A board is any flat surface. Anyway. A table is I, a flat surface. We've, we've already talked a lot about <laughs> Waffle that... House. I don't want to discuss board <laughs> games at this point. Can We're we done. Tables? We're over. You can come for tables next time. Speaking of which, we've already decided what we're going to be doing next time. If you're reading along with us, no. We are reading Dune by, I don't remember who it is. Someone faint. You can look up Dune. Everyone knows fucking Dune. It's like one of the biggest sci-fi fantasy stories ever written. I'm going to remember the guy's name and it won't be, it won't matter. No, no, it won't. I know it. we're, We're reading it. I've read it before, actually, but we're rereading it because there's a movie coming out in October. Mm -hmm. So if you're curious about reading the story before the movie comes out, or maybe watching this after the movie, there's your chance. And even if you plan to watch the movie and not read the book, I would consider checking out the episode. Because Dune is one of the most interesting books in the sense that, like, in the first two chapters, it tells you exactly what's going to happen. Like, it lays out, it's like, oh, this is Paul. He's the chosen one who's going to go to Arrakis and lead it and become the leader of Doom. And somehow continues to keep you interested in what's happening after telling you all of that. We can't put a spoiler tag before what Joe just said. You literally don't need a spoiler. It's in the first fucking chapter. Like, it's good to go in knowing that that's going to happen. It makes it better. So, yeah. Yeah. Be sure to check that out. It'll be a hell of a time. Either way, Bardbreaker, thank you for joining us here. It's It's been a fun time. It has indeed, sir. Thank you very much. And again, be sure to check out his channel. I should have it linked down in the description. I hope if yeah, not... Yeah, you said that you'll... before. I did it once. <laughs> You've only been twice. And, uh, you know, Brandon. That's me. <laughs> At least next time there won't be any bad accents. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. God, I don't know. You're please. probably going to try to do like an Arab accent. We're going to be in the desert or something. Wow. I don't have any you, trust in you. You think so little of me. Yes. I think so little of Dan. <laughs> yes. Uh. There we go. <laughs> but yeah, either way, you can look look forward to that. I appreciate you coming out. Thanks to Yahtzee for writing a book. I make long outros. I continue to say things. Either way. Brandon, do you want to do the sign off? Uh, I guess I'm the only one who's focused on that okay all right so thank you for joining us and keep reading not even gonna do the until next time keep reading just keep reading always i'm very distracted as what the was going on at the end there we had a fun time we did have a fun time